at least from from what I've researched, the first track that you ever recorded on was recorded in 1994, right? The first professional one first prof- that, first that got released and yes. people actually paid for it. <laughs> yes, the first the first pro recording was That's called. right. Yeah, it was yeah, 94. Yeah. Yep. So this year marks 30 years in, That's in the right. rap game. We, I, should, I guess I should do something, right, bro? That's why Hold I want to chat with you this year. Chris, what do I do for my what do you do for your thirtieth? Should I receive a pen? <laughs> Should I receive a pen? <laughs> <laughs> a pen and um a pen and a nice and a nice cake. Cardi, yes, thank you sir. for coming to the crib, man. I appreciate you, bro. My pleasure. I know we were trying to make this happen before the summer, but you've been tied mm. up, or you've been traveling. I saw you were like, just did like a performance with Usher, and like you, as always, you're Mr. International for real, bro. Like you're moving around all the time. Word. I'm just gonna get comfy on of your course. couch. Please do, bro. Dope couch. I might have to leave with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, listen. For me, that's that's kind of been my life for the past 25, 30 years. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like it's not. For me, it's not a um, it's not a new thing, but it's also become so so much a part of my life that um, I don't even I don't even really think about it too tough. You know what I mean? It's usually when people are like, "Oh, saw you here, saw you there," but that's just that's just how I live my life, bro. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think I can pinpoint it back to when. I remember standing on a roof with um, with uh, Director X, Bobby O'Neill. I'm pretty sure Taj was there. And I think they were like shooting in LA at the time and we were there trying to make it, mm-hmm. really. And I remember us standing on top of a roof and they're like, bro, you gotta get out. Like you can't stay in the city. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're like, you know, we kind of just, we're having a reasoning session and they're just like, yo, if you love the city, you have to leave. Because for what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it, you couldn't stay local and do it. Right. And at that time, this was way before like the internet was the dominant force that it is now to where it's like you can travel the world still sitting on your couch. You know what I'm saying? Through the through the World Wide Web, it was a time where you had to physically be places, mm-hmm. meet people, you know what I'm saying, break bread, be eye to eye, and have somebody look at you and be like, you know what, I'm gonna take a chance on this kid. And that's what it was like back in those times. So I think since then, I've always kind of just made it like a part of a part of who I am, you know? Absolutely, bro. And I, when I think about you, and I think when Canada thinks about you, they automatically think of, you know, this guy's an ambassador for culture for us, he's an ambassador for music. Because you've been doing it so long, but you've also always been waving the, the Canadian flag, waving the Toronto flag. And I think that, you know, you think about Drake and all the artists that are broken through and that's all good. But you were the first one that really kind of kicked that door down, I think, on an international level. Mm. I remember you being, you know, being a young kid watching BET and watching your videos, bro, like on BET. And for us, as you know, growing up in Toronto, we would look at BET, we'd watch these of music channels to to find out what's hot to see what's popping right of course and you were you were the first one of the first canadians that i remember being on there like you chaos and a few others but Mm -hmm. you were always kind of at the forefront of that when you look back at those days now and like you said do you think that you could have done that without leaving canada hell no Mm -mm. and i think the ones any of those people that you mentioned at some point in time did have to dip Mm -hmm. um there's no There is no successful Canadian that is globally successful and didn't have to leave, unfortunately. There are other places that you go, all right, in 2000 and, I think it might've been 2003, I got this phone call and um, Mr. Morgan, who was my manager at the time, he's like, yo, there's this, he's like, yo, there's this group, ironically called Texas, but they're not from Texas, they're from the UK. I was like, never heard of them. He's like, they sold 25 million records at that time. Mm. I was like, I said, now imagine me, I'm like, I was trying to 
wrap my brain around it. I'm like, how can somebody sell 25 million albums and I've never heard of them? But the reality is that there are other countries that have the infrastructure to allow for people to be massively successful and sure have some global impact, but they could like literally stay within their borders. You know right. what I'm saying? Like there's US acts that are massive where the artists are doing well, they're wildly wildly famous and popular, but they don't have to leave America if they don't want to. Whereas we come from a place where, you know, one of the only like one of the the few artists that became globally impactful that actually signed in Canada was Celine Dion. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like outside of that, all, almost everybody, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but mostly everybody else had to go outside of the country because for whatever reason, we still haven't figured out a way to formalize the process and um, be able to have like a real pipeline to mm -hmm. global impact. And I say that to say that like we are steady, we meaning everybody who's still active, we're still trying to build that, you know what I'm saying? We're still trying to figure out a way every day, even if it's just a little piece, is to keep building and keep building to where we have that, that foundation. And I think if you look at from when I was a teenager, when I was a kid, to teenagers coming up today, like it's night and day, you know what I'm saying? Like they have so many things that are available to them, so many opportunities, a lot of resources here within Canada, but it's, you know, um, I say unfortunately because I think for a lot of people, traveling should more be a choice than something that you have to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't have to dip outside of the country to survive or to flourish. You should be able to stay within your country and be like, yo, this is my spot. I'm not going anywhere. But the reality is that we we all got to move around. You're you're in an interesting position now, too, because you see you've had the transition of going from strictly a creative to like going to the label side, being an exec now. Well, listen, I, it's it's super important for me to say diversified because it's like transition to me. Um, and I think I, it's funny. This conversation came up the other day. There are people that just stop doing what they, you know, the creative side and they're like just strictly behind a desk or what have you. And, you know, no disrespect to them whatsoever. But it's like to me, um, I look at it as a diversification because it's like I'm still in studio every day. I'm still producing, writing, um, doing all the things. And it's like I think on the artist side, for me, the only difference is that. I've gotten to a point and I understand how valuable it is to be able to do a few different things and to have different streams of income, but it's not even about the income, just different things that you're passionate about in life and be able to participate in all of those as opposed to like, I'm going to be a rapper and I'm just, that's all I am is just a rapper. You know what I'm saying? It's like to be able to be a rapper, but to be able to also have so much fun participating in like legendary things that you just dreamed about as a kid things that were not made available to us mm -hmm. coming up you know what i mean it seemed like something that people far away did you know what i mean people that were not in our neighborhoods but now it's dope you know what i mean seeing you know a kid like me that you know grew up in flemington park and scarborough and vaughn road and you know what i'm saying lived in a bunch of different places in the city i think it's ill that like you know my parents didn't come from money or anything like that really just it was the grind and the hustle and um just really trying to be smart and think about the long term those are the things that got me to where i am today but when i say it's not special circumstances the gift is special but the circumstances under which I use the gift are not special. Right. Meaning like if you're somebody that has an incredible gift, um, the thing is that we are now at a place to where I think it is um, much more feasible to think that you are able to have a career in entertainment. Even if you think about what we're doing right now, there was not this opportunity 25, 30 years ago. You know what right. I'm saying? For somebody to be able to turn on their computer and see this interview happening in Germany or in London or mm -hmm. in Montana or wherever. You know what I'm saying? It's like there is a lot more platforms and opportunities for us. 
um, now. And I think it's because of people like you and others that really, you know what I'm saying? Like, use next to nothing in order to, like, create something that, that, people, that people could benefit from. And if you think about Toronto culture, not just on the music side, meaning, like, in terms of being a singer or a rapper, even if you look at people like, you know, Nyama Guinea, if you look at people like Master T, you look at people like Michael Williams and all those other people that did, you know, within their disciplines, you know, really worked hard and sacrificed so that there could be more for the next generations. Like, mm -hmm. those are the people that mentored me and really showed me the importance, you know what I'm saying, of not just, not just doing a thing for yourself, but also what does it mean right. for the place where you come from. Of course. Going back to your transition to the label quick, I wanted to ask you, being a creative and being able to be in a position where you could kind of pull the curtain back a bit, what was the biggest revelation for you going into this journey as a creative and understanding something that you're like, oh, I, I would have never have known this if I didn't have access to this position myself? Mm, that's a good question. Um, the, the biggest thing is that I think as creatives, I mean, listen, a lot of us are crazy anyway. Um, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's where the beauty of the, of the art comes from is that we're just able to like really channel certain energy and vibrations like into a song or into a piece, you know, if it's director X, you know, into a video or a movie. Um, but I think it's that like we get together and we feed we feed these imaginary cycles to each other to where we're like, yo, this is why this is happening. I bet this is what's going on. But when you get down to it and you look at it and you take the emotion out of it and you can't have art without emotion. Right. I think when you take the emotion out of it and you kind of see what is happening behind the scenes, I'm not saying that it's good necessarily, but going behind the scenes to understand the dollars and cents and really see what fuels the industry side of it, you have a better understanding of why things kind of turn out the way that they do. And I think those people that have been able to flourish are those people that have figured out a way to navigate that. You know what I'm saying? Either if the artist knows it themselves or they surround, their, they surround themselves with an incredible team uh, that is able to like disseminate the information to the artist, those are the people that always win. So if you look at the for good or for bad, the Kanye's of the world, the Drake's, the the Jay Z's, the Jay Cole's, um, you know anybody that has made it big within the industry, it's usually people that have a great balance of incredible art, but also their business acumen is like fantastic. You know what I mean? And that's why I said like it doesn't matter if you love a person's music or not or what have you, you kind of have to at the very least have a respect for them educating themselves or having people around them that are incredibly smart that'll you know what i mean help them to keep evolving as the industry changes you you, you mentioned in uh, in infrastructure and something that i've heard you speak on a lot i feel like that that is something that it, as canadians we need to strengthen mm. so that talent doesn't have to leave or feel forced to leave like you being in a position now where you've been the creative you you're behind the scenes you've you've done a, an amalgamation of different things. Mm -hmm. If you could suggest to the Canadian industry, let's say you had the power to like do something differently. What the would you do industry, differently? Yeah. Yeah, the, the Canadian music industry. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. say specifically around hip hop, black around music. Around hip hop, mm -hmm. black music. Well, I can't really, I don't, you know what? I don't even think it's fair to say that it's necessarily for us to change much. Um, I would say in this country, what I would change or like to see more of is for for the for people to not be so risk adverse. Is for people to take those. It's not even risky. Like the thing that I never understood is that hip hop and black music in general has been such a a force, has been such a a, a leader in culture and music for decades. So I never really understood why people didn't double and triple down the investment. They did in America. So I, I never really understood why we didn't double and triple down here. You know, what you know what I mean? In terms of investment. I always thought that was, seeing both sides of it, I always thought that was weird to me. 
yeah. that we didn't that we didn't take bigger chances because I've seen them do it in London, I've seen them do it in the States and in you know in some other territories around the world. You see it happening right now. Um, like in India and other places to where like these artists are getting out there and 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 really killing it so it's like I, I still don't understand why we're not leaders in that especially knowing that all those different people that I mentioned there's representation here within the city of Toronto and here within this country there's people from all around the world and it's like we literally have access um, to be able to have you know, some real foresight when it comes to these things. Like, we should be ahead of the curve. And I think here, creatively and culturally, we are. It's just that we don't have the vehicles that will also support the vision of the creatives the way that they should. And I wish I wish we did. You know what I'm saying? Um, hopefully that'll change in the future. And it is getting better. You know what I mean? It is getting better. I see that there is a lot more investment um, that is happening slowly here. So that is dope. And that is encouraging. Um, but it's just like, uh, do we have something simple, even like a place for artists to showcase their material here? Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Live, we could do way better to where we should be able to go someplace. There's places all over the city where you can go and see bands play. You know what I mean? They'll go play, they'll go do their rock, they'll do their country and do other things. But do we have a consistent place here where we can go on a you know first monday night of every month and go see who are the new hip-hop dudes who are the new afro or afro beat artists who are the, the new whatever like nah we don't have that consistently anymore right. or not even quarterly or you know something to where um you know other places they they have it and i know they have it because i've performed at it globally you know what i'm saying like whether back in the day um, they used to have, I don't know, you go to London and, you know, there's different spots where you go where, you know, like if you go here, that's where all the grime MCs are going to be at. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, where you can go hear the hottest singers. If you go to Philly, there was places all the time where you could go hear, you know, the illest new neo soul singer or whoever the ill producers are. You know, there were these interesting pockets of community that was developed and built and sustained in a lot of these different places, you know, R&B Live in L.A. or New York or whatever. Um, you know, I think a lot of missed opportunities here um, for us not being able to have a place. But that also goes back to I can't. That's why I say I can't fault the culture, because a lot of the establishments won't give us the places. You know, what I mean, a lot of places don't want to be associated with hip hop and black music, unfortunately. So it's tough. You know what I'm saying? Because I know that for us, we forever have been wanting to have a place, you know what I mean, where we could, whether it is, you know, perform live or even a place where it's just where you can go and, and just hear dope hip hop on a regular basis. Unfortunately, if it's not something that is marred with violence, then it's just marred with ignorance of people not wanting to have hip hop played at their venues. Right. Right. And we don't want to often talk about it, but we know what it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know all the popping spots on Friday and Saturdays. <coughs> Excuse me. Like, back in the day for us, it used to be what they used to call Four Corners down on Richmond there. Yeah. And then now I know King Street, you know what I mean, is a zoo every Saturday. But you can't really go places to hear hip-hop. That's true. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't, for the most part, want to run that. Yeah. For fear of the type of crowds they're going to attract. My, my experience has been similar to what you're saying in terms of platforms. Mm -hmm. Like, platforms will go and come. Mm -hmm. right? We were talking about Strombo earlier. Strombo had a great platform that's quieted down. Mm -hmm. And it's usually because of lack of funding or, like you said, there's a, the, investment the companies are not willing to invest. And if they are, it's maybe just for a short period of time and then it fizzles out. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the, like I, this interview series that I'm doing. This is independent now. Mm -hmm. I was with Complex for so long. Mm -hmm. Complex got sold. You know how the thing works. Yeah, sold yeah, yeah. and got amalgamated with a different company. Complex mm -hmm. in Canada is now on hiatus. Mm -hmm. That's a huge platform that so many artists, especially in the hip-hop community, would look to for, for representation, to get their music out, to get a look. Complex in Canada is not operational anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, the infrastructure, as we're talking about in Canada, is lacking already to begin with. But then when we lose these platforms, it's like another hit. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. So these are things I'm trying to even just talk to people like you, like how do we fix this? How do we develop infrastructure and platforms that have longevity so that Canadian artists can continue to flourish and not have to leave, you know? Hmm. That's the million dollar question, quite literally sometimes. Um, you know what it is, is continuing to, for people like yourself and myself to have the conversations. Cause you know, the other funny thing is that there are a lot of really smart people that have the money, they have the opportunity that sometimes just don't have the relationships. So right. what it is, is that a lot of times it's the same circle of people within this Canadian industry that work with each other. Like right. you show up and you're like, oh, it's the same people, same production companies, same producers, same whatever. And the, the interesting thing is that I meet in my travels a lot of interesting people, some that are, you know, people from Canada that have moved, you know, overseas or to the States or wherever. I think what it is is just like continuing to build relationships because what's going to happen is somebody is going to take a chance. It might not be somebody that's within that same circle of, um, of the industry that happens here, but you're going to meet that person to where you're like, you might sit with them and they're like, that's an incredible idea. You know what? I'm going to rock with you on that. And you know what? Not only am I going to rock with you, but I'm going to invest. I'm making it up mm -hmm. $200,000 for us, just for this project alone to make the thing happen. Let's check it out. Let's see. Right. Let's see what I'll go on. And I think you see that happen a lot more outside of the country. But every once, every once in a while, um, there are those folks that, you know what? Let me stop it there. What I'm going to say is that what's cool, especially with hip hop, is there's a lot of people that are now in coming into positions of power that have grown up on the culture. So where I used to have to like deal with these guys where, you know, no disrespect, but like after work, those guys are, you know, going to the pub, they're going to listen to whatever they're going to listen to. And they don't participate in the culture. Like these right. are not people that grew up and it's like they go back home and they're going to, you know, they're going to turn on, whoever you know what i mean me drake jay nas whatever these are you know um those are people that grew up listening to whatever they listen to there is a whole new generation of kids that are now adults that have gone through whatever they went through and their positions to where they're making these opportunities a little bit um happen a lot i think a lot more frequent than than back in the day and I think the only way that we are going to see infrastructure built is when that becomes consistent, when it becomes movements and not just a moment. You feel what I'm saying? Right. So I think when these things like sometimes there's dope campaigns that happen and they're looked at as one offs as, oh, well, that worked for them. It's not going to work for us. I, th I think once you start to see consistent growth, um, you know, new dynamic energy that's put in places of, of power so that they can affect change, that's when you're really going to see the infrastructure start to grow. Because infrastructure is something that takes a lot of moving parts coming together to consistently, interdependently work together to form something that is, that is dependable and sustainable. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer, man. I think you're right. It is sometimes more than a moment. It's yeah. about how do you catapult this moment and make it a movement. I mm -hmm. think that's the right that's the right way to look at it. For sure. Just having the right people on board and making that uh, a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. I wanted to to take a second because earlier you as an artist and as a Canadian, you're bro, you have every accolade. You're like the most one of the most decorated Canadians as a musician. But earlier this year, mm -hmm. you got an honor that I want to ask you about that not a lot of people get. Mm -hmm. You're now Dr. Cardinal official, right? <laughs> or as I say to my cousins, Dr. Cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, when I saw that, I was so happy for you because I'm uh, like, this is, a, this is the type of honor that is unique, but it's an honor. It's like a huge honor huge. to be recognized by, you know, the, the school that you went to that you didn't even finish. That's right. Right. Your, your, your course. Mm -hmm. But now you come back and they're like, Dr. Cardinal, like they, they bestowed that honor upon you. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that, man. How, how did that feel? 
Oh man, that was that was an incredible one, especially like you know, a lot of immigrant families like <laughs> the reality is sometimes us um the younger generation like even though um it's wild that I'm becoming an elder slowly but surely but it's like looking at like my parents generation like the piece of paper meant everything you know what I'm saying um we grew a lot of us you know with our parents wanting us to become doctors lawyers engineers Facts. you know the mm -hmm. regular things and then, you know, when I said to my, you know, to my folks, hey, I'm going to try this music thing, I know that's not essentially what they wanted for me for my life. I think they were okay with it, as most immigrant parents are, once they saw the success part of it. But being able to go back now and receive that honor amongst others, it's a different kind of pride that I saw in my mom and in family that a Grammy would still not be able to fulfill. Um, being able to, to get a doctorate was something that was incredible for my family. And it also signaled something different to the city and to the culture as well. Um, I love when you're able to push boundaries and those things that we've always been unfortunately we've been looked over a lot of times. I think it's always dope when um, when they're able to realize, yo, you know, doctorates shouldn't only go to this type of person, person that does this type of job or looks this type of way or speaks a certain way or comes from a certain place. Um, I thought that it was incredible. And, you know, shout out to, to not just, you know, York University and the alumni, but if you look at those folks that were in charge of making the decisions, when I got to meet them, I got to understand how diverse and how in incredibly forward thinking they were and I realized that it wasn't a token thing you feel what I'm saying because unfortunately especially the, the last few years when all this diversity and inclusion or whatever has become a buzzword and the mm -hmm. things that these corporations try and do right. to kind of check these boxes you could tell and that's why I went there in the first place that York was a place that been about that life you know what I'm saying for real for real in terms of like it was one of the most diverse uh, post-secondary establishments within the country and I've always been proud of York and to be able to uh, go back and not only receive the honor but actually you know give a, a speech to the one of the graduating classes was super ill and I can tie this up with a, with a bow very quickly um, shout out to, to Tuma Basa because Tuma he sent me um, that's my Friends since the 90s, literally, Tuma is um, the global head of black music for, um, for YouTube. And Tuma sent me something, and I was like, oh, this is incredible. Um, basically, it was somebody talking about a doctorate and what it means to receive a doctorate versus somebody that spends four, four to ten years getting their PhD and becoming a medical doctor or whatever. When you go to school to become a doctor, you get a piece of paper that is a promissory note that says, hopefully, you'll do well. You got your, you know what I mean? Like you got your degree, doesn't mean that you're gonna be a successful doctor. When you get a doctorate, that's a piece of paper that says, you have done well. Wow. And that's the real, that's the real difference for me and that's why I think it was so impactful. So shout out to Tuma for that because that kind of just brought clarification to the distinction for sure. That's huge, man. Yeah. Again, I was super happy when I saw that. And I started to even just preparing for this entry, I started to like look back at, at your journey and I'm like, man, like at least from from what I researched, the first track that you ever recorded on was recorded in 1994. Right? The first professional one first prof that, first that got released and yes. people actually paid for it. <laughs> yes. The first <laughs> the first pro recording was That's called, right. Yeah, was yeah. Ninety four. Yeah. Yep. So this year marks thirty years in, That's in the right. rap game. We, for actually, you. I guess I should do something, right? Bro. Th that's why Hold I wanted to chat with you this year. Chris, what do I do for my, what do you do for your 30th? Should I receive a pen? <laughs> Should I receive a pen? <laughs> <laughs> a pen and um, a pen and a nice, and a nice cake. That's hilarious. We but gotta, yeah, it's 30 years, man. We got to get you that pen. Something at least. <laughs> but at dude, the very 30, least. 30, so as I was looking at that, I'm like, man, 30 years in the game, like the impact that you've made is extraordinary, bro. Thank you. In the in the game, and like as a 
as a hip hop fan from time, mm -hmm. watching you grow, you've always been the guy waving the flag that I've always looked at like, I'm glad we have Cardi, man. Mm. Because you, put, oh, you really dope. put on for us, bro. So Thank I you. wanted to give you your flowers and say that. And also just kind of look back at even some of the highlights, bro. Like, again, I, I'm reading all this news on the Junos. And I remember when you mm -hmm. guys won the Juno Award for Northern Touch. Mm -hmm. And you guys ended up giving it back. Mm -hmm. You guys won the award and it was like, we appreciate it, whatever, but we're not going to accept it. And I, and I just want to interject and say shout out to the Rascals because they, they called us. And they're like, yo. Because people don't understand, although Northern Touch, it was a group song, but it was the Rascals yes. yeah, yeah. featuring all of us. And they really called us and they're like, yo. We really want to be, we want to let it be known, like, you know, the way that they treat hip hop, it's, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not what's up, it's not cool, and we really want to make a statement, and they're like, yo, if you're down, like, this is what we were thinking, and I think all of us were like, hell yeah, you know what I'm saying? And we, and we stood with them, and, um... And do you remember at that time, what was it specifically that the conversation was that, that hip hop wasn't getting the respect at that time. Because I know that conversations continued through the years with the Junos, Unfortunately. right? Unfortunately. But at the time, what was it? It wasn't being televised. The I think, easy, right? Yeah, that, I think that was like, that was the easiest thing to pinpoint and identify is that we're like, yo, we deserve to get some camera time. Yeah. You know what I mean? We deserve to have. Um, to have our award shown to the rest of the country and not just the Saturday night, you know, before all the hoopla kind of thing and being kind of mentioned as an afterthought, you know, on the big night. I think um, it's funny because, you know, sure, the Rascals and, and myself and Thrust and Shocks and Checkmate, we all band together and, and, um, and did that. But, you know, this is something that, you know, people boycotted the Grammys. You know what I'm saying? For 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 mad years for for the same kind of thing. So I don't wanna say it's it's uniquely a Canadian problem, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, the, the plight of black music has always kind of been stained with no matter how successful you are and how big the genre is, for whatever reason, they always seem to reserve um you know that 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 big, the big spotlight for, for, we'll just call it others. And I think that's always been kind of, it's been very disappointing to the, to the, to the black community. And I'm sure there's other marginalized communities that, that kind of share that sentiment, you know what I'm saying? Where they're overlooked um, and underserved. And, you know, for us at that time, you know, it felt good to be able to represent, because it wasn't just for us, it was about the community. It wasn't that it was a Rascals thing or the Northern Touch crew. It was just pretty much like, at that time, in terms, especially in terms of Canadian hip hop, it was a pivotal time. Because in terms of like, we toured the entire country from Victoria to the, you know, the, 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 the farthest point on the East Coast. So we literally, you know, in person saw the impact that that song had on the country. And I had never seen people show up in droves. It was sold out across the country and people were, were literally losing it at that time. And like, even for us, we were like, wow, like we're seeing this, this, this Canadian pride really growing behind, <clears throat> excuse me, behind this song, Northern Touch. Mm -hmm. So it was we, the first time there was like unity in that Yeah, capacity yeah, yeah, in that right? kind of a way from East to West yeah. Coast with rappers from here and then rappers from Vancouver as well. So we understood the importance of what the song meant and what it meant to music at the time, not just hip hop, but to music. Cause that song also, uh, for whatever reason, probably again, going back to platforms that we no longer have, but when you think about much music and how that song was in high rotation, so that's going to be in the mix next to whoever else was out at the time, Alanis Morissette or Bare Naked Ladies or whoever was out, we were right there with them getting heavy rotation. So we were becoming a part of the, the DNA of the country's musical landscape. You know what I mean? Not just hip hop alone. So with that, knowing all the eyes that were on us, we knew that it was going to be something um something that uh you know would be a dope representation for us trying to really you know what i mean plant our flag as 
as a genre that was worthy within this country. Of course. And I think that that impact has lasted through the years, but it's still something that gets talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, when when anyone feels like the Junos are sliding a category, it's like, yo, remember when <laughs> this happened with Northern Touch, right? And then, so fast forward to today, I'm bringing it up too, because yeah. I'm reading this news on the Junos had announced at the beginning of this month that they were putting the reggae category and the gospel category on hiatus. They were no longer going to do it. Then last week, it was reversed. It was reversed because of the the reaction from the, the public, backlash. The backlash. But the good thing is, it does show like the you know when people speak up, when people revolt against a decision, sometimes it can make an impact, right? Sometimes. So like what you guys did, what's happening now, it was reversed. My concern is is almost like why did it happen in the first place, right? But how do you, what are your thoughts? Oh, uh, here's the, here's the thing. The thing is that like. Can't even call it a love-hate relationship. I've had a complex relationship with the Junos, no pun intended, over the years. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm, I don't want to sure. speak for the genre or for other groups. But I'm not, I'm one of those people I go where I'm celebrated. I don't go where I'm tolerated. So if people have outwardly said, you know, pardon my French, but we don't fuck with you. I'm like, all right. Fuck off. Like, I'm not going to go beg somebody for something. And if somebody does not value my contribution or my genre's contribution or my community's contribution, then I, me personally, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time trying to change your mind as to why I think it's an important thing or why the community or the, the genre is deserving. You know, rest in peace to Denise Jones. Like, she fought every year for reggae you know i mean to like really have so much more of a part in the junos and then after she passes away and even after they did a little special tribute to her it's wild that they would get rid of the reggae category but somebody you know i'll just leave the names out but like a big artist from the states is like yo what's going on are you guys in an uproar and i'm just like Kind of, you know what I mean? Because I'm just like, bro, we've been dealing with this for decades. So we can't even get super upset anymore. Um, because it's like, how many times do you need to get punched in the face before you stop trying to go into the place that's doing the, the punching? Like, you know what I mean? Like, how many times do you walk into a brick wall to where you're like, yo, they're never going to cut that piece out and create a door there. It's always going to be a wall. So I'm one of those people, while we don't even need to get that deep, but I look at the world differently. Like I look at back in the day, I look at the Jim Crow era or 60s segregation. And I see those people that used to like go to the white, uh, the white restaurants and they used to sit in there and they used to get punched, spit on, cursed out. I'm one of them black people that might have been in the in the neighborhood and been like, you let them keep them dumbass restaurants. Like, I may not have been that guy that understood the importance of wanting to go there. Like, conceptually, I understand I understand what it did for society. And I understand that it created freedoms that my children are benefiting from today, those people's sacrifices. So I under I understood right. why they did it, but I'm not necessarily one of those guys that would have been tolerating all that shit because I'm going to fight back, I'm going to punch back, or I'm just not going to deal with you. And how it might be a little bit rough to compare that to the Junos, but it's like, I love the Juno Awards. It's always a good time. You know what I'm saying? Like, as anybody else does, I love to celebrate music, especially amongst your fellow Canadians. But what I, you know, what I don't love is year after year going to a place where I'm like, do they even want me here? You know what I'm saying? And that feeling, they'll never be able to understand what that feels like. But that's how it feels for us year after year after year. Is it's like, are we here because they have to have us here? Or are we here because they really want us here? Right. And that's the conversations that we have with, um, you know, with the organization year after year is, is trying to figure out like how can we make this better and to be honest last year's Juno Awards was a good ass time 
good ass time shout out to <clears throat> excuse me shout out to advance um you know the whole advance crew was down there mm -hmm. and there were a lot like i don't know if i've ever been to a juno awards where they had that many black artists at the same time like it was crazy we had you know we even threw our own after parties and you know for hip-hop it was ill you know what i'm saying me and scratch bastard did a party and everybody from nelly Furtado to um anybody you can think of um why can classified um everybody came out to that joint right so last year was, was really encouraging and really dope so when this announcement came out this year i was just like mm -hmm. this is what i'm talking about like you know what i mean step like forward then a step back right, right yeah. two steps forward three steps back <laughs> yeah. so yeah. it's tough man i hear you um you brought up advance and i know you as a philanthropist, that's like a whole other side of you that I think some people are starting to realize too, but maybe a lot of people don't know. Mm -hmm. What's what's what do you have coming up in the books, man? Because I know you do your Christmas party, which I've been to. Mm -hmm. You've raised thousands of dollars for different organizations. Mm -hmm. Why is that important for you, man? Like as a as a MC, as a rapper, as an artist, it's it, it's kind of easy, bro. To be honest, it's mm -hmm. the way that I was raised. So first and foremost, my mom. My mom has been entrenched within community work. She, you know, she used to work for the Board of Education. Right. And she's been, to this day, I, I really just wanted to enjoy retirement, but she gets no joy in sitting around. So she's still very active within the community. My mom won a Queen, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Award for her anti-gun violence work in the city. So it starts at home. Um, so shout out to my mom. But then on top of that, like even just my mentors, like people that mentor me back in the day. So whether that be, you know, what I'm saying Wendy Motion Brathwaite, whether that's people like John Bronski, Master T, um, Oren Isaacs, just a plethora of people over the years that have kind of instilled a certain responsibility that we have. If it wasn't for those type of people, a lot of us would have had a different mindset. You know what I'm saying? Including myself. And because I had it reinforced at the crib with my mom, that's why it's always been important. Because I think even when I started doing my my charity events, which is, you know, turned into the Cardi Christmas party, it was really at a time to where I was throwing the parties just because I love throwing parties. You know what I'm saying? Right. Since I was 18, you know, shout out to Alexandra Park. I used to throw I used to throw birthday parties in the projects, you know what I'm saying? And then as I went on, I started throwing it in venues. But to me, you know what I'm saying, I'm making money. I'm like, why do I want to throw a party just to, you know what I mean, to like to make thousands of dollars for myself mm -hmm. for what? You know what I'm saying? When yeah. I could partner with people to have a dope event, but also be able to like positively impact the city. And I think, you know, for me, for the past oh man 20 something years now throwing those parties like every year it's still something that the city looks forward to but i just love the fact that i was able to partner with a lot of corp uh corporation corporations sorry and a lot of different entities to where people really do come together and donate you know what i'm saying right. and i'm able to like provide opportunities together and especially the last 10, 15 years together with my wife, with our organization that we've had, we've, we've partnered with a lot of different people, but we've been able to bring kids to Japan, to India, to Africa, last year to the Philippines. Like we've gone and we've done these incredible transformational trips with some kids like that have never been on planes before, right. but they're going to places and they're building schools, they're building hospitals, they're learning about the cultures in other places. And that type of experience for somebody when they're 16 or 15 or whatever, it's like, it's literally life-changing. Like they'll never look at their circumstances the same. So when you talk about philanthropy and why I get involved is I think opportunity is the biggest, biggest, biggest solution to a lot of our our problems here or a lot of things like when people you know say well how can we change that is being able to give people the opportunity yeah you know yeah you're right man mm -hmm. i feel like a lot of us um especially in creative fields and 
coming from immigrant homes, coming up in places like Scarborough, Jane and Finch, whatever, it's hard to find mentorship at times when you're a young person growing up. So I think that these programs, you know, shout out Toronto Arts Council. I've, I've also worked with them. I've worked with a bunch of people, you know, but I agree with you, man. I think it's so important to give back and I love what you're doing, bro. And I love that you're able to feed various uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. You don't just work with one. You're able to provide for it's, so many. It's tough though, because you say to yourself, like, you want to help everybody, but I think very quickly you realize that you can't help everybody. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the other the other reality is like it's a catch twenty two because you spend all your time on that other side. You're not nourishing your network that could help the other thing. True. So it's like if you're spending all your time giving back, sometimes it's tough because you're you're not gonna be able to meet those people that are like, yo, I'd love to help, or how can I donate or whatever. Because I mean. And this is not to name drop, maybe it is, but like, I mean, over the years, when you think about it, everybody from, everybody from Nelly Furtado to Jay-Z to Sean Paul, you know, we've had, I remember one year, the dope year, like, all the years have been dope, but one year we had, you know, Just Blaze and Dave Chappelle and... Like, we've just, we've just had so many incredible people that have come and taken part in my, you know, in my Christmas events. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what, it, that's what it is, though. Like, it's being able to, like, live the life that I, that I live in terms of traveling and, and doing the work. But it's like, how do you make that benefit where you live? Like, how do you make that relevant to the city? And I think, you know, being able to... I remember when Jay-Z bought the tickets, like, he paid... Like, didn't blink, and I, you know, for him, it's whatever, but, um, you know, I remember him, whatever the number was, it doesn't matter if it was 10, 10 grand, 20 grand. Right. He was just like, he was just like, yo, I'm buying these tickets, give them tickets away to the people of Toronto. Wow, amazing. You know what I mean? He's like, yo, here's my accountant's number, and literally within an hour, I was like, well, guys, I guess the party's free, courtesy of Jay-Z, you know what I'm saying? Or... You know, whether it's Chappelle who flew himself in on his private jet just to come be there and party with us for, you know, for a good cause. But then most importantly is you get the community that is at the receiving end of that. And of it's like, whether it's the, you know, the Black Label Coalition that I started at Universal that, you know, they've given away hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years to different businesses across the country, whether it's Advance, you know, shout out to Viv and Big C and Miro. Um, you know, that started that, you know, me and my wife's charity, 30elephants.com, any one of those things, what's most rewarding at the end of the day is being able to say, yo, like, I use my opportunity, platform, and influence for something other than myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I rarely use the word charity because I don't like it, I don't look at it as, as charity. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not a... A hand out, it's a, it's a hand up, you know what I mean? Meaning that you're extending your hand to help somebody else as opposed to you're doing somebody and you're looking down on them like, here, accept this charity. No, what it is, is it really is just human partnership, you know what I'm right. saying? To where in some type of way, that relationship that you're building is a relationship where you're doing something together. You're not necessarily doing something for somebody, you're doing something with somebody. I feel you, man. I want to end on, on a music note. Yep. Which I know is your first love. Yes. Um, for music, let's, let's talk about the current, uh, I guess if you look at the run, right? It's like there was predecessors before you. There was Mishy, Maestro, guys that came before you. Then there was mm -hmm. your era, mm -hmm. Cardi. Then there was the Drake era. Mm -hmm. Now you're in a position where you're, you're an A&R. You're able to kind of maybe help select who the next Drake, who the next megastar is going to be. Mm-hmm. Where do you see that? Where do you see Canada's next star? When do you see that happening? Do you, do you see that happening soon? Like, how do you foresee the, the future of who's going to carry the flag next for Canadian hip hop? Well, I think, it's, I, think it's, I think the way that the world is moving, it's much different. Before, even if I, 10 years ago, and the funny thing is, um, there's another reason for another a watch and a, and a cake is that I think this year marks like my 10th year as an, as an executive. Right. And even what that means is, is much different. Before I used to think I got to find the next whomever, Weekend, Drake, Cardinal, 
Tory Bieber, whatever. But what I have understood, and the reason why my title is Global a r at Def Jam, is because I am not... I don't work with, with, with Tunji and Def Jam as like... as their guy who's kind of just like combing the streets of Toronto or you know, looking at Canada with a magnifying glass. I do stay tapped in here and I know what's up, but it's not just in a traditional capacity that I operate, meaning I might not find the next lead singer or solo artist that is going to be the person. What it might mean is if I'm working with at a Kunle Gold, it might mean that there's a producer in Halifax that is a sick Afro beats producer that nobody's ever heard of that I can now connect to at a Kunle Gold. Or if we're using real examples, it's being in studio with a Skip Marley or a Massacre or a Susan Carroll or whomever. And now I'm able to put these writers, Canadian writers, in the rooms with them, Canadian producers in the room with them. There's so much more than just being, you know, the, the, the artist with the spotlight on them. A lot right. of times, you know, as we know, we come from a place that has, you know, Matthew Burnett, Jordan Evans, Boy Wonder, T Minus. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting, I saw, I think it was Nelly Furtado was on The Breakfast Club. And she was talking about T minus. And, you know, she goes, You guys know T minus? And they're like, No, I don't know who T minus mm. is. And T minus is responsible for some of the biggest hits of course. in hip hop. But that's, that's kind of my point is it's not always that person that's going to be well known in front of the camera. And I think that is part of being able to grow the culture and grow opportunities for, for Canada is not just by like focusing strictly on trying to sign artists. A lot of times it's being able to like put the right people in the right rooms together with people because that's also um, how our industry can grow. Of course. Go, man. Um, I'm going to end on a couple speed round questions. Oh, shoot. Okay. Cool. I'm going to start with this one because you mentioned Boy Wanda, T Minus. Yes. Who would you say is the best Canadian producer <laughs> of all time? <laughs> the GOAT. Who's the GOAT? Uh, there's a bunch from El Angelo to Frank Dukes to T minus to Matthew and Jordan to and I'm just talking about the established ones but I would have to go with Wonder I think Wonder really sorry shout out to Wonder Girl too shout out to shoot there's 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 too many. There's too many, but I would I would have to say that uh, that wonder. I would say that wonder is the goat. Um, known him since he was in high school, and to see how he he really did something that hadn't been done before him coming from coming from Canada for hip hop. For sure. You know what I'm saying? Like he. There was a time I remember not too long after his first placement with me on Not for Sale, maybe like a year later. And I was trying to get a re-up. He's like, I got nothing. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, <laughs> I sold every beat that I ever had. You know what I'm saying? So to see him work with so many different people and even to this day still still get plaques left, right, and center from hard work. Yeah. I, I would say I would say Wonder is my producer goat. I, I, don't, I don't think anyone would disagree with you on that. He's He's been putting in work for a long time. For sure. That's also, I would put him as my top two. Yeah. Um, I know you're a big basketball fan. Hold on, fan. wait, wait, wait. You said your top two would be the other one. No, my top. Oh, just He'd your be top, my top. He'd be okay. my top. He'd be okay, my top. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, I know you're a big basketball fan, big Raptors fan. I got to ask you, who's the, who's the groat, the, the greatest Raptor of all time? Uh, people argue with it, but I think for me, it's definitely Vince. Yeah? For me, it's Vince. And here, here's the reason why. I look at the Raptors the same way that I kind of look at music sometimes not all the time but sometimes Vince helped create an industry here Vince right like all right we live in a generation where or not even a generation we live in a time 
where we are able to timestamp everything because everybody posts everything. You know what I mean? How many times have tweets resurfaced to where it's like, in 2012, this person said at 9 a.m. on, you know what I mean? Like right. to where there's, it's, it's very... It's all documented. It's linear. There's yeah. a line. You can see when the thing happened, where, who said it, whatever. Vince came up at a time where, um, the, it, like, had there been social media back then, it would be, there would be no question as to who the greatest Raptor of all That's time was. Vince, yeah. first of all, like, never mind what he did for the city, the NBA wasn't messing with us. Players did not want to come to Canada. They literally didn't want to come here, like, at all. So by Vince being able to, you know, have the, the highlight of his career be while he was a Raptor, and for everything that he did from the dunk competition and playing for the Olympics, and um, although he never won a ring, I think he was able for us, even us in Toronto, to really understood, understand what it's like to be like, nah, we, even though they have a purple dinosaur on their jersey, people are like, no, I, I rock with it. And the thing is, it's like revisionist history will make people think that we always supported the Raptors. Right. Do you know, even in recent history, like within the last few years, I wouldn't take fans from Toronto, like I wouldn't take pictures with fans that had on Lakers jerseys or had on Knicks jerseys or anything else. Because the thing is like in Toronto, it's only now that people can be like, oh, what are you talking about? Yo, Toronto rappers forever. Or, you know what I mean? Canadian music forever. There was a time when people were ashamed mm -hmm. to be like, yo, I rock with Canadian, Canadian artists. And it's the same for basketball in this country. What Vince did during his tenure as a Raptor can never be overlooked. And if you were outside at those times, I think anybody from that era yeah, we could be pissed the way that Vince left, but in terms of his contributions while he was here, Vince helped create the foundation for basketball here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I think that people, here's what, I, and here's how, how I'll end that piece off. People talk about, and don't get it twisted, I love Kyle and DeMar and, all the, you know what I'm saying? Like all the ill Raptors that we've had over the years. There's way too many to mention. But I think we were able to have that Raptors championship because all those pieces work together well. If you take away one of those players, we wouldn't win the championship. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was the fact that we had the chemistry at the time. If we had the right leadership within the Raptors organization during the Vince time, and he had those pieces, then it would have been leaps and bounds, no pun intended again. Like by far, it would, there would be no question as to who the greatest, the greatest Raptor was. I think what it is, and I understand that, so mine might be a hot take, just how I live my life. People sometimes, they only see the successful part, and that's the part that they stick to and that they rock with. Sometimes people can put in a hundred years of work and there's a guy that comes from nowhere, could come from Russia, and after the hundred years of work, just put one little ingredient on the top, all of a sudden something works and guess who they're gonna credit? Not the hundred years of people putting in the work, but the one guy that put in the last final ingredient. And I think with Vince, when it comes to basketball in this country and in this city, Vince was really the guy to change everybody's opinion on what basketball could look like being in Canada, what it looks like for ball players to play in Canada, and he definitely helped make our organization cool for sure. Well said, man. I've heard a lot of people obviously have that take, mm -hmm. but not explain that way. It's true. He, he put in all the legwork so that other people could come and build on what for he sure. created. Yeah, it's a good way to look first at it, time, Yo, listen, even if we're just talking hip-hop, it was the first time that people started referencing left, right, and center. You know what I mean? Ball from Canada was all those, all those Vince lines that people used to, 
whatever it is, dunking with their elbow in the rim or yeah. any one of those references, like that was the first time even culturally that people actually acknowledged us. Even though we had ball in the city long before Vince, but you know what I mean? Okay. Not including yourself, who's the greatest Canadian MC of all time? Basing it on what? That's, that's how, however you categorize being an MC, however you want to look at it. I've asked, I've asked a couple people this question and then what I've noticed is the comments go wild, but the debate always in the comments is, well, what do they mean by MC? So maybe explain what an MC is to you first. Uh, all right. I, uh, so what we're going to say is because you didn't say, mm, well, that, I can't even, that's, that's even unfair, but because you didn't personalize it and say, who's your favorite MC? And you said, who is other than myself? Who's the, who's the greatest? It's very, I don't, I don't think it's any question that I could say Drake. I don't think so. Um, but I think that in the same way that like, if we were in the States, it would be easy for somebody to say Jay-Z or Nas, or even if you went to J. Cole or Kendrick, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the best per se, because Black Thought, although not as famous or pop like famous or maybe as wealthy or whatever is mopping the floor with probably anybody so right. if you were to ask me about like my favorite mcs my favorite mcs are not the regular you know what i'm saying thing because it's very important that there's a distinction that that was brought to my attention the other day and i said ah that's the best way to look at it there are people that like hip-hop and then there are people that are involved in hip hop, two different things. We could go down to the Lululemon store and a lot of those women are like, oh, I love this song. Are you, are you crazy? I love hip hop. They don't participate in it whatsoever. Right. They have nothing to do with the culture. They like the music. Where we're at today is there's a lot of people that have nothing to do with hip hop. They just like the songs. So they think they're a part of hip hop because they love the music. It's like loving an NBA player, but never stepping foot on the court. You can't, play, you can't play ball for shit, but you think that Kobe is the GOAT, or you think that LeBron is the GOAT, but all you like is their dunks that you right. see on the highlights. So I'm not, and again, I'm not drawing parallels between that and Drake, but for me, I think when you look at all around, um, for sure, I think it would just, it would be, it'll be easy, um, it'll be easy to say Drake. Now, if we're just talking about like, based on like just absolute, just like, just a skill and nothing else, you don't even have to be successful, people may not know about you, like that's, that's something different, you know what I'm saying? Because it's like, people that inspire me, like there's a lot of young kids right now, they're not even, to be honest, not all of them are even young, but, there's a lot of kids right now that I like that are so fire, like classic people like Tona. Tona, the last year has dropped so much fucking just ferocious fire, like Tona's been consistent and just been tearing things down. Uh, people like, um, people like um, Daniel's son, people like a son, people like Sazy. Uh, there, yo, there's so many ill, ill, ill rappers right now. You know what I'm saying? Like people that I, people that I, I really respect and that I think are J. O. Mayors. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot of rappers right now in Toronto that I think are not just Toronto, but in Canada that I think are, are super fire. The only thing with rap in this country and just rap in general, not even just in this country is that we're at a bit of a crossroads to where lyricism is coming back, mm -hmm. but maybe the powers that be are not so interested in investing in lyricism. So that's the tough part, because culturally, it's such a dope time, you know what I'm saying? Like, Griselda and rappers like that. I remember when Griselda, you know, shout out to Combat Jack, when I first started hearing about those guys years ago, 
I was like, yo, this is so fire. And they kind of felt like the outliers. Whereas now, lyricism is coming back in a big way. And there's uh, so many dope, dope rappers that are like, um, that are really, really culturally starting to do a lot. I think we're just at a, a very, very interesting point in hip hop to where I don't know what the next two years looks like. You know what I mean? Like, are we gonna be at a place where it's, and there's a place for everything. I just don't know what's gonna be at the forefront. Right. Um, we saw how this year, the back and forth between Kendrick and Drake was lyrical, super lyrical from both of them. Right. And it was the first time in a long time that something super lyrical caught the attention of the whole world. So now people understand that it's not just about vibes. You know what I mean? Everything is not just all vibey all day. Everything is not ass shaking all day. There is a, a massive contingency of people that are, have always been into lyrics and there are some that now aren't as ashamed to say it because you know, it, it is what it is. The last, the last five years or so, like lyricism has kind of taken a back seat to everything else. You know what I'm saying? You see, um, and again, not good or bad, I'm just showing you what it is. Meg the Stallion and Ice Spice and all kinds of other artists that, you know, we go out to the clubs and we have fun listening to their music, but it's right. like what I'm seeing now creeping back in is stuff that has just a little bit more depth to it. You know what I'm saying? You're seeing... As a, as a music exec, is this also something you could put your weight behind? So here's, so here's the thing. Let me choose my words correctly. I don't give a fuck about all that music exec shit. Like, for me, it's always music first. So I'm never going to be somebody that stands behind some dumb shit just because I work with or work at a label. And I think that's the reason or part of the reason as to why... Um, I'm able to have fun doing what I do, but also to why they respect what it is that I'm doing is because I'm good on the dumb shit, bro. I don't care. Like, you understand what I'm saying? I understand its place within the industry. And I understand that if there's some shit that literally you're just like, we shake our heads and we're like, but it's selling 10 million. I'm like, all right, cool. Let it, you know what I mean? Like, let it do its thing. Right. But. I don't think any of that is going to be around in five years from now. And I've always been the person that believed in who is that artist that has the potential to still be here 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, no matter what the platform is. Somebody that is going to transcend TikTok, IG, or whatever it is that they build within the next few years. Who is that person that's going to be relevant to all those things, but what they're bringing to the world is bigger than any platform. Right. And I think that's how you have the true, you know, the true monsters of the game is those people that it doesn't matter if it was back in the day with Snapchat or whatever, or if it's today, again, you know, with TikTok or, or whatever's rocking, it's not really about the platform with those people. Like their fans are going to follow them wherever they go and however it is. Because my dream, the reason why, <laughs> the reason why during TIFF, why I wanted to go see Elton John's movie, like I was like, I want to go see that. I want to know what it's like to be 70 and 80 years old and still rocking. Not doing some hole in the wall at 70 because you just love music and you have to keep doing it. How, what is the mindset behind somebody that is 70 years old and still doing arenas or stadiums or whatever. How do we get to that level with hip hop? You know what I'm saying? Or with R&B or whatever form of black music, period. So when you talk about being an, an executive, that's my bottom line, is figuring out how to preserve, nourish, and build the culture. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Do you think that there will be an audience for a 60 plus rapper? As songs are good. If they're dope, hell yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think we're in a time where there's, 
they've given they've given megaphones to clowns. That's facts. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't think that everybody's opinion should be something that's amplified. And I say that only because I hear the wildest, craziest stuff all the time in terms of like people who I never thought I thought were untouchable in terms of, oh, it's clearly evident what this person has has contributed to their genre, to their country, whatever. I hear people talk wild about Jay-Z to where people are like, who is Jay-Z? What are you talking about? Nobody fucks with Jay-Z like that. I'm like, are we talking about Jay-Z? But this is something that I've also had to live with and understand is that we're at a time and place where hot takes are an everyday thing. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? You literally could be the world's best journalist in terms of you could get all the awards, you could become a billionaire, and there's still some people that would be like, he hasn't done anything. Yeah, yeah. And because they have the platform to say so, there are some people that will be like, yeah, I agree. And that's the weird world that we live in right now. So, you know, for me, nah, I really think it is, it is possible. Um, listen, if we, even if we're looking at LL Cool J, LL Cool J came out. When I was seven years old, bro, like what you understand, like yeah, it's been LL around cool for J, a long time, yeah, maybe eight. Like when you think about what, like I don't know if it's possible for people to even think about what that means because he's literally, possibly one of, not even five people that are from hip hop that have been able to do that. You know what I mean? Like at that age, LL Cool J is doing songs with. I think he has a song with, I should know this because I'm with Def Jam, but I think, I'm pretty sure he has a song with, with Lotto, the same way that he has a song with Ross, the same way that he has a song with whatever, but still album produced by Q-Tip. And when his album came out last week, it debuted in the top 10 in a lot of categories. And for somebody to be nearly 60 years old and to be able to still do that is a testament. I think especially in hip hop because it's so competitive, people think if you're not number one on Billboard Hot 100 that you're washed. You understand? For hip hop, it's always been an all or nothing mentality. But I think slowly but surely, as people get older, they're like, wait a minute, I'm the age now of people that I used to make fun of. And they're like, yeah, but I'm dope. And I'm still doing dope shit. They're like, oh shit. And they start to change the way that they think to understand that it's not just about being 24 and on top of the world, that there is an entire lifetime to be able to create music, to enjoy music, and be able to promote music. And I think, I think, yeah, I think there will be a time that the 60 year old MC isn't looked at the way that it is today in 2024 mm -hmm. because we've you know a lot of us have said this if you look at the stones if you look at a lot of these rock groups that are still touring still and doing massive numbers still killing it it's because their genre and their communities have come to understand they're like yo yeah true my guy's old but it's like his music is still incredible and i think once we separate the ageism from the quality of music within hip hop will be fine. And slowly but surely that's happening. That's a good point, man. This is the longest speed round that I've ever had, but your, your answers are amazing. Uh, well, have... if you know, <laughs> the speed in track and field was never my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have one last one. Okay, okay, I'll try and make it quick. It, I, okay, the, the question is, yes. if you could produce mm -hmm. the new modern version of Northern Touch mm -hmm. with six MCs, you're, you could be on this one. There actually is a song, like the day that we're recording this, it's not finished yet, but it's in the process. There's some dope MCs that are on that joint, so there is a new joint that's coming. But I think right now, I'm gonna cheat. cheat. I'm gonna cheat. Yeah, yeah. There is people like, uh, man like Clear Tamir, 
Double M, uh, Danielson, Sazy. That's four. Um, Are you putting yourself in this? I leave myself out. Okay. Um, there's a cool guy from MTL that I like, uh, Mike Shab. Mike Shab, yeah. Um, oh, you're being literal with six. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> It would be like... It's hard, though, because... All right. Because even with females, I like... I like Double M. I like Taylor G. Um, I like Goldie London. We're going to be here for a couple hours. <laughs> so those are... <laughs> like, I like those. I like them. It's tough because, because I am a producer, though, bro. I know. It's like I'm always trying to think of also, like, things that would make sense to of go course. together. Because some of them would work, like, some of them, if we were to rock on some boom bap stuff, some of the, like, people that traditionally rap on trap wouldn't necessarily make sense and vice versa. Right. So if we're talking about, like, the, like, an actual crafted joint, if we're just talking about spitters, that's something different, but... What about just six artists you think you would love to see together on one collaboration track? And you, you could be on this one, too. Unless you don't want to put yourself on. And it doesn't have to be newcomers. No. Oh, man. Um, if everybody... If there were no egos involved, mm -hmm. and, like, I was able to... And I was able to broker something. Yeah. And six in total. Yeah. All right, let me try and wing this. Drake, Weekend... Bieber, Tory, oh. Cardinal, who would round that off? That six spot is tough. Cause do you put, do you put Nav in there? Mm. That'd be a fire do, track. You, do you put Party in there? That's kind of rough. You put Daniel Caesar in, it, it's rough to do six. But I think, do you know, do you know how, like how insane that would be to would just be, see? That would shut it down. That would break the internet. That would, everything would happen if that, if that ever came to be. Yeah, I, I mean. So, okay. Drake, Weekend. Bieber. Bieber. Tori. Tori, you. Mm-hmm. And either PND. PND, Nav. Nav. Am I missing somebody obvious? I think you got. I mean, Jesse Reyes could be on there. Shit, Jesse, Daniel. Jesse, Daniel. There's a lot. Yeah. But that would be a fire track, man. That would be that would be absolutely out of control, insane. I hope you could one day broker something like this, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, me too. I, listen, I just like to see all of us in the same room. That'd be amazing. Less. Yeah. Well, first steps first. Let me try and get everybody in the same room. You got my support however I can help, man. But Shit. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I think so too. Dope, bro. I think so too. Thank you for coming through, bro. I appreciate yo, you, man. This is a dope talk, yo. Thank you, brother. I Thank appreciate you for having me.